Good afternoon, brethren. Hello. <laughs> so, welcome once again to our service this afternoon. This is going to be our last service for this day. And praise be to God for giving us uh, nice weather, isn't it? Kind of a windy uh, outside, but there's uh, sunshine. But praise be to God that once again we can come together in spirit and in truth here in our church for our folks here and also for our um, brethren who are watching in our uh, live streaming uh, welcome once again to our uh, service welcome to bergen bible baptist church so as a way of our preparation once again uh, please uh, let's have a moment of silence as we pray for this service to be a channel of blessing to each and every one of us let's pray Amen. So thank you, Pastor Abel, for that beautiful music. So are you ready to worship God in singing? So may I request everyone uh, to stand, please. And let's sing, My faith has found a resting place. My faith has found a resting place. on the first now my faith has found a resting place not in the Christ or Queen I trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall flee I need no other argument I need no other plea it is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves this and my fear and doubt. A sinful soul I came to Him, He'll never cast me out. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. My heart is leaning on the Word, the living Word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through His blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. Amen. What a beautiful song, isn't it? So it is enough that Jesus died and that He died for me. And we know that He rose again after three days. So let's sing another song. Um, a shelter in the time of storm, 530. A shelter in the time of storm. And I would like to request Brother Jackson to open us in a word of prayer after this song. On the first now. The Lord's our rock, in Him we hide. A shelter in the time of storm. 
secure whatever will be tied a shelter in the time of storm oh jesus is the rock in the weary land a weary land a weary land oh jesus is the rock in a weary land a shelter in a time of storm Shade by day, defense by night, a shelter in the time of storm. No fears, alarm, no foes of fright, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. On the last stanza, O rock divine, O refuge dear, a shelter in the time of storm. Be thou our helper ever near, a shelter in the time of storm. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, the weary land, a weary land. Oh, Jesus is the rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Amen. Please remain standing. Mother Jackson, please. Let's pray. Lord, we humbly uh, come before thee uh, this morning. Thank you once again, Lord, for this privilege that you have given us. Thank you for, uh, give, uh, for allowing us, Lord, to worship you today. And I just pray, Father, that uh, please uh, give us, Lord, the right mind, the right heart, as you're going to be uh, receiving your, word, uh, your holy word this morning, Father. I also pray for your preacher we're going to be using. I just pray that please give him, give him, Lord, the wisdom that he needs. And also for these people who are going to be listening, just pray that may, may we have the joy, Father, in, serve, in receiving your word. And once again, Lord, please be with us. And please keep us always mindful, Father, especially, Lord, uh, the preaching. And I just pray that whatever distractions are going to be, I mean, the, the Satan is uh, delivering to us. I just pray that please uh, keep us always be have that peace, Father. And once again, Lord, I also pray for those people who are watching or listening in their houses. Just pray that please uh, bless them too, Father, as you bless us also in this church. And once again, please be with us and please keep us always mindful, Father, in what we're going to be doing this afternoon. Once again, thank you so much, Father, for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jackson, for that beautiful um, prayer. So you may now Stay seated. I <laughs> stay standing, please. All right. So let's sing another song. And please greet your uh, fellow members there, uh, brethren here. So I can see your faces, but your eyes are smiling. Amen. So can you please greet them? Say hi. Okay. And good afternoon to everyone. Okay. So let's sing 529 day by day. On the first, same. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure Minging toil with peace and rest Every day the Lord himself is near me 
with a special mercy for which I'm. All my cares He gladly bears and cheers me. He whose name is Counselor and Father, the protection of His child and treasure is the charge that on Himself He laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me He made. Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith with consolation. Offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meet thee, there to take us from my Father's hand. One by one, that is the moment's fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Amen. Did you enjoy the singing? Praise the Lord and thank you for your uh, voices. And you may now be seated and let's hear from our choir. So, we all was set in motion as a father planned. This was a grace so overwhelming that it allowed for nothing, nothing to keep us from Him. He's so full of mercy. Even though we were dead in our sin, He chose to make us alive through Jesus, His Son. But it took the sorrow of the cross to complete, accomplish the joy of salvation. And now, because of this divine offering, we can bring ourselves, our burdens, and fall on our knees and draw near to His cross. We are redeemed because of God's extravagant, amazing grace.
Amen. Praise the Lord for that beautiful song, isn't it? Are you blessed by it? Thank you for the ministry of our music ministry, our choir. And praise be to God for um, the people that God entrusted us to, you know, to deliver that beautiful song. Amen. So, and thank you also for Pastor Abel for his dedication and his desire to teach us a beautiful um, music and songs for the glory of God. And praise be to God for our choir. Hindi na tayo nag-iisa, dumami na tayo. Amen? Alright, so praise the Lord. We started in our live streaming. I believe that our Manalo family only are singing before, but praise be to God that we can, our people are joining us in our singing to our choir. So praise the Lord for that. So, good afternoon once again. Wala nang nag-good afternoon. Good afternoon. Alright. So, hope that you are still awake, alive, enthusiastic, and alert to our service this afternoon. So, praise be to God for this morning, for giving us a beautiful message. And also in our Sunday school for teachers who are willing and willing. Teaching us the the truth from the Word of God, thank you very much. Okay, and also our Pastor Max uh, this morning who preached the Word of God. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, we are going to have our mission moment, and our Sister Rochelle will read the mission report. So thank you. Afternoon, church. Um, this is a mission report from, sorry for my pronunciation, the Landingen family <laughs> from Calvary Baptist Church of Cambodia. <laughs> uh, dear pastor, friends, and church family, and the peace of God which passeth, passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.7. This verse has come so true in my heart as we are facing hard trials in our life. I was scheduled to fly back the first week of February as soon as I found out that Cambodia had an opening for re-entering the country. But then, on January 14, at midnight hour, I suffered an unusual pain in my heart, which I never felt before. I was rushed to the emergency room of the nearest hospital. I was placed in the ICU for long hours without any idea what was happening to me. I was comforting myself knowing that God was in control, and I began to have that unexplainable peace in my heart. Then the doctor had to tell me that I was suffering a massive heart attack and I needed to be transferred to a tertiary hospital in Manila to save my life. I am grateful for my wife, Noemi, who stood beside me during such a hard trial. Also, family members who bared no thought at the expense to assist right away in order to save my life. To have made such a decision has also come with a lot of costs and expenses with hospital receipts. Praise God for my cousin who happened to be a doctor in UK and was able to work out for my transfer in one of the best tertiary hospitals in Manila through the help of some doctors. She graduated with, with where I was confined for nearly a month. We saw God's hand move as he opened doors for me. He gave me one of the best cardiologists, Dr. Solomon Claridades, who explained how unique and different my case had been, especially at a rather young age like mine. He encouraged me by saying to me, don't worry, I will be God's instrument to save your life. Praise God, he even sent me a young Christian doctor. His final, diagnos his, final di bleh, sorry. his final diagnosis was that I had a multiple heart blockage that needed an immediate heart procedure. So I underwent an angioplasty <laughs> procedures last January 19, 2021, and they had to put five stents. I stayed another week in the hospital, knowing that everything is okay. God is so good to me, and I went out in the hospital that following week, and I thought everything would be fine after that proce procedure, after a week. Oh, uh, everything would be fine after that procedure. After a week, they brought me back in the emergency room in the hospital because of the fast, irregular heartbeat that cause, can cause me a sudden death. But then the doctor told me that I need to have an ICD defibrillator, installed in my heart to regulate my heartbeats. Wow. February 13, 2021, they installed the ICD and I stayed for two weeks again in the hospital. I am alive and recuperating now as I share this news with you. 
Unfortunately, everything they have done to me in the hospital just to save my life is at a very high cost. The amount to pay in my first procedure cost us $40,500 in total. And God provided everything we needed. And we paid everything. And we are praising the Lord for his provision. We thank God for those churches, families, relatives who sacrificed and gave their best to help us financially assist. And then the second procedure last February for over two weeks in the hospital cost us another $20,000 in total, which God already provided half of that expense again. The total cost is over 60,500 US dollars on both of my procedures. And as you know, we do not count with such amount to be able to pay for such bills. But praise the Lord for his provision that now we are just short and need, need, and need to pay only 10,000 US dollars in all the total hospital bills. I come before you knowing and trusting that I will count specially on your prayers for a prompt recovery. And the missionary work is in my heart and in my mind constantly, and I know the Lord will allow me to continue working for his glory once I am back on my feet. I am more than grateful for another chance as the Lord has allowed me to get through. I deeply ask for your constant prayers for God's comfort for my family, as I have not seen my children for all those weeks and for the rest, and also for the rest of my hospital bills. I don't know where to get the remaining balance of our debt and how we can be able to pay the rest of my second procedure, but I trust that the Lord will continue to provide and he will finish the work he has already begun in me. And please continue to pray for me because I have been told by my doctors that the first three months of my recovery is still at risk of heart failure because as at this time, the heart rate of my heart is only 32% out of a normal 60%. My wife and I are more than grateful for all your prayers and support during the hardest part of our life. Our love be with you all in Christ Jesus. You are all in our thoughts and prayers. God bless you. Safe in the hollow of his hand, your missionary, Joseph and Noemi Landingham. And that is your mission report for this afternoon. Amen. Thank you, Sister Rochelle, for that. Um, reading the missionary letter and let's continue to pray for pastor jp as he is recovering from that um, procedure and operation and everything in his heart and let's continue to pray for the provision of god uh, that god will give them the grace that they need every day amen and their ministry as well in cambodia is our one of our missionaries so let's keep on praying for our missionaries amen we don't know what they're heading we don't, we don't know what they're uh, facing right now and just just uh, have to pray for them and if you can support them then uh, it will be a help okay so thank you once again and at this time uh, before we have our offering we have a special music coming from our one of our birthday celebrants for this march amen sister rain and after that, our offering, and we have another special number. So we have two special numbers for this afternoon. Thank you. the stars one and all he knows how much sand is on the shores he sees every sparrow that falls he made the mountains and the seas he's in control of everything of all creatures great and small and he knows my name every step that He knows my name I don't know what tomorrow will bring I can't tell you what 
what's in store I don't know a lot of things I don't have all the answers to the questions of life but I know Amen. He knows my name. Thank you, Sister Rain, for that beautiful song. Amen. And for rendering that special music for the glory of the Lord. And it's good to see our young people uh, giving their talents. Amen. And giving um, glory to our God in singing. Okay, so at this time, we are going to have our offering. I may request to ushers, please, to come. And let's remember our um, faith promise, okay, our giving, our, our tithes. And let's continue to pray for God's provision and for our needs in our church and also for our missionaries that we are supporting. And blessing that we had a meeting last oh, yesterday uh, for the, those uh, new sets of missionary. And let's continue to pray for them, okay. Shall we all stand, please, as we sing our doxology? Sing it now. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. But I have this book. Yeah, let us pray, Lord God, once again, Lord. We just want to praise you and thank you so much, Lord, for who you are in our life, Lord. Thank you so much for providing for our needs, Lord, and thank you for our jobs and thank you for. And our good health that you give to us. And Lord, thank you so much once again for this opportunity that we could give what belongs to you, Lord. And thank you so much for uh, all those missionaries that we are supporting, Lord. Please bless this offering, Lord, to be used by you, Lord, in your ministry, in this church, and also for uh, to our missionaries 
everywhere, Lord. And we thank you once again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Henry, for that prayer. You may now be seated. And we have another special number. Amen. Amen. Before the preaching of the Word of God, and after this special number, uh, Pastor Sam will come to preach the Word. I call on Sister Nelly. Amen. That was a blessing, isn't it? Uh, thank you so much, brethren, for singing for the glory of God. I appreciate the messages of the song uh, from our congregational singing. Uh, songs that are just uh, co correlated, connected to our message today. As uh, you've seen there in our screen, the title of our message is The Storm Before the Calm. Sounds like... Uh, 
It's kind of opposite, isn't it? Sometimes we say the calm before the storm. Like uh, what we had uh, when we had our uh, snowstorm uh, this winter, you know, if you notice like the day before was like a little bit sunny and seems like there's no storm approaching, then suddenly the following day after 24 hours we had all those snow. So uh, we will continue our uh, series in the life of Christ from the book of Matthew and our study this afternoon is found in Matthew chapter 8. A very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, I praise and thank God for uh, the lesson this morning from Pastor Max. I was uh, praying and contemplating about preaching about the cross and the resurrection before those wonderful seven men will preach about the last saying of Christ and Pastor Gideon preaching as our guest speaker for Easter Sunday. But we already have a prelude from Pastor Max, so that's good, you know? And we could never exhaust God's message about the cross, isn't it? about the passion of Christ and resurrection. And even if we preached the same text, the same verse of scripture is still relevant and uh, powerful and fresh because it is the very words of God. It is the Bible. And um, as a quick review before we read our main passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to uh, 27, that can also be found in Mark chapter 4, verse 37, and Luke chapter 8, verse 23 to 25. This is uh, the time when Jesus quiet a storm. Uh, just a quick review of our studies so far from the book of Matthew in the life of Christ. Matthew chapters 1 to 4, we see the person of Jesus Christ, isn't it? We see uh, how he was born through uh, the conception of the Holy Spirit, through the Virgin uh, Mary. We saw his birth, his childhood in Luke chapter 2 also, uh, cross-reference, his baptism. We preached a sermon about that, his temptation. So it's a blessing that Christ truly put on human flesh, becoming a real person to do for all of us, other people, what we could not do for ourselves. And that is to live a righteous life, isn't it? And live and fulfill the law. Then that's Matthew uh, chapter 1 to 4, the person of Christ. Then Chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew, we saw the principles of Jesus Christ, where we saw the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached about the practical principles that are life-changing and gave masterful illustrations that opened the eyes of understanding and helped to make it the world's greatest sermon of all time. His Sermon on the Mount, we saw the Beatitudes there, we saw illustration uh, using the, the light and the salt. Uh, as portrays to believers. Then now in chapters 8 to 9, we are seeing here the power of Jesus Christ. If we saw his person in chapters 1 to 4, his principles in seven, 5 to 7, now in chapters 8 and 9, we saw his power. We see a series of miracles that he performed. Of course, if you claim to be the Messiah, you have to show signs for the Jews to believe you, isn't it? And Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy, and he wrought these miracles, he delivered these miracles, he performed them as a sure sign that he's from God. So we saw that he cleansed uh, somebody from being a leprous person, he calmed the storm, and later on he will cast out the demons. So we can all say that Christ has power over the physical, the he has power over the natural, and he has power over the spiritual, isn't it? Because he is Lord of all, Amen. He is, has power to cast out demons and evil spirits because he is above them. At the end of this book, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the Bible declares, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. So we can say that the same Savior that created the universe and spoke this world into existence can not only heal the hurting or still the storm, but also he can save our souls. Amen? So today we will uh, zero into that particular verse of scripture when he performed one of these miracles when he quiet the storm that the disciples were into with him. So let me ask you to please stand with me and we'll just read uh, a few verses of this account. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. All right, if you're there, say a hearty Amen. Okay, let's read it all together, then we'll have a word of prayer. Begin. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him, 
And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come humbly to thy throne of grace, Lord, recognizing that we are nothing without you. Uh, we needed thy grace, thy mercy, uh, once again to be extended upon us today. We just want to praise and thank you for this day, for another day of life, for the great salvation that we have in Christ, for uh, the manifold blessings that we experience today, um, just this borrowed life that we have and this Lord's Day that we can worship the God of the universe, our Savior, our Redeemer, is already, Lord, uh, a blessing. And just to hear your people come here uh, with good attendance, with a good heart to sing praises to your name, just hearing the special music, just hearing um, the teaching of your word throughout the whole day, Lord, we are so blessed. We are so privileged, Lord, that we can still enjoy our freedom of religion and the freedom to worship the one true living God. And we acknowledge, Lord, our uh, weaknesses, our infirmities, our shortcomings before you, our sins. Lord, I, I commit myself to you. Forgive me from all my sins and my shortcomings. And uh, wash us, Lord, cleanse us with your precious blood. May you bind the works of the enemy. And may the love of Christ uh, prevail in our midst today. Uh, give us listening ears and understanding heart. Help me, Lord, to rightly divide the word of truth this afternoon. And we praise you for who you are and what you've done and what you'll be doing uh, in this very day. And we ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may all be seated. Uh, Pastor Jethro was uh, commenting a while ago while we were there. It seems like we are in a normal church setting because we have so much people in our church today, so it's a blessing. Thank you so much. Appreciate your presence today. Uh, as we all know, uh, I think we can have like 50% of our normal um, capacity in the church. So thanks be to God for uh, your presence today and all our um, friends and brethren who are watching online. And I hope you're still awake. I know uh, some of you had some good lunch and, and, and good food. And uh, as we know, it's a uh, sort of like a stronger temptation when you're in the afternoon trying to listen and concentrate and then our flesh, our carnal nature wants us to uh, uh, relax too much and fall asleep. So let me uh, say something of a joke. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna be funny. Where's Rochelle? She doesn't laugh at my jokes. Uh, there you go, I heard a laugh, that's good. That's encouraging. Proverbs 17:22 says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, isn't it? So here's some medicine uh, today, friends. And uh, I always remember what Brother Bobby said. You know, if you uh, uh, laugh by yourself, you need medicine, you know? <laughs> yes, laughter is a good medicine, but don't be too obvious laughing by yourself, you know, because some people might report you. So there's uh, somebody that posted in FB. He said, do not accept a friend request from Hormel Foods. It might be a spam. <laughs> okay, you get it. Uh, okay, how about Libby and Vienna sausage, you know? And you've heard this before, what do you call a nun in a wheelchair? There you go. It's kind of, yeah, offensive, no? So I will not say the answer. Let's ask me later, <laughs> personally. So, okay, there you go. Let's go to our lesson, um, the storm before the calm, and uh, Brother Gilbert will help me with some of the slides. Uh, as we know, Jesus had the power over demons, disaster, disease, and even death. Praise be to God. And um, we know that in this uh, great country of America, if you remember uh, this terrible hurricane, uh, Hurricane Katrina, that had happened in the New Orleans, I believe in 2004, that wrought devastating uh, uh, destruction in that area, and uh, it took many, many years for them to rebuild and to see some normalcy. There's a, a great surge of that uh, uh, hurricane that covered a lot of places with great flood. Uh, that hurricane that came from the Gulf Coast, 
Though it's calm now and the water has receded uh, many, many years, it left in the wake is devastation that maybe we can still see some of it today. And of, in a literature, in English literature, life is compared to a voyage at sea. The same is so in music, such as the song, The Lighthouse. All right, we have some slides here about uh, The Lighthouse, all right? And uh, some of you probably had visited some wonderful lighthouses, maybe in Rhode Island or uh, part of the East Coast in these New England states where you can, um, they're not working anymore, most of them, but they are like museums or they are like a tourist attraction, all right? And uh, there's another one. Wait, I, I love that one. I love that uh, shot there. And uh, seems like uh, kind of peaceful. Maybe that's uh, the dusk of the day. And there's like that little path there that you could travel. And there's that beautiful sea. And it's just black and white. But just try to imagine if you've been in a lighthouse uh, on, on some sort in, in this country or other countries. So probably you know what I'm talking about. And there's a song, The Lighthouse, that says, there's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlook life. See, when I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I might see. And the light that shines in darkness now will safely lead me o'er. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would sail no more. Uh, marami na pong special music. <laughs> and uh, I remember Brother uh, Baladaja. He sang this song uh, with a guitar, I think, in our camp meeting, no? And I said, wow, what a wonderful rendition. From the heart. Uh, it was really um, uh, heartwarming and soul-stirring because he can really identify uh, with that song because his life was changed by Christ. It was a turnaround when he got saved. And in that chorus, he says, I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to him. For Jesus is the lighthouse. Amen? Amen. Because Jesus declared that he is the light of the world. He came 2,000 years ago in a darkened world, and um, he is the son of God, S-O-N, and he's also the son of righteousness, S-U-N, and he brought forth light in this darkened world, and now we who got saved are a reflection of that light. We are also called to be the lights of the world, isn't it? But it all was made possible because Jesus came as the lighthouse, as the light for, for this darkened world. It says there in that song, for Jesus is the lighthouse, uh, lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I might clearly see. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? Where would this ship be? Where would we be if not of Christ's light that lighted our path? Now we're not the children of darkness. We are now the children of light. Then also there's a song uh, Till the Storm Passes By, written by Moses Lister, one of, uh, one of our favorite songs. Not just we sing this when somebody died, you know, but it's always applicable when you're going through a storm in life, a trial in life, a testing. There you go. Our very own Brother Bob sang this wonderfully, magnificently last uh, Wednesday when he sang about... Um, the storms of life that we go through as uh, he relates to the message about Job is suffering that experience. And you know, this famous uh, song, classic hymn, In the dark of the midnight have I oft hid my face while the storm howls above me and there's no hiding place. Mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord, hear my cry. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more. Till the clouds roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand. In the hollow of thy hand, keep me safe till the storm passes by. It always bless our hearts when we hear, when we sing that wonderful song. Especially when sometimes we're in the midst of a storm. Somebody says, for a Christian, you know, either we're going to a storm, we're approaching a storm in life, we're in the midst of a storm, or we're just going out of a storm. And uh, Job said that man's life is short and full of trouble, and sometimes storms brew out in our lives. So even the Apostle Paul used this metaphor in 2 Timothy 4.6. We have a, the verse of scripture here, 2 Timothy 4.6. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. The word departure here is a nautical term, uh, a sea term. 
you know, meaning to pull in the anchor and set sail. Pull in the anchor and set sail. So our text today that we just read in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27, we find Jesus and his disciples on a literal sea. And we can learn much about our voyage through life by the way of this passage. This is the Sea of Galilee. Let me project, okay? Uh, it's uh, 13 miles wide, uh, uh, 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. And it's surrounded by mountains and hills. So the cool air that comes from the mountains can mix with the salt air that comes from the sea and it can cause sometimes sudden storm. And uh, I'll ask the consent of my pilgrimage people from Israel from 2019. We will post some picture of our literal <laughs> privilege tour in Israel. That's the Sea of Galilee. Actually, it's a lake, you know. And uh, we were there. It was really calm. It was tranquil. And um, we were in a boat. And it's so calm and everything that you can hear the other boat maybe like uh, several hundred feet away from you. You can still hear their voices because it's just peaceful and calm and the waters are nice. And we were so blessed because during that day, uh, the Sea of Galilee was in the right mood because our tour guide, next slide please, there you go, that's the background, uh, said when he was there with uh, another group of people a week or so, they had storm, it was raining. So thanks be to God because baka yun lang yung panahon makapunta kami ron. At least we're able to see it. There you go. And uh, I remember Sister Jay uh, putting her feet in the water. And uh, I was looking for some tilapia actually, carpa, because I heard that that's what they fished during that time, you know? In John 21, when Jesus prepared fish and, and fire and food for the disciples after they have caught nothing. And take note... Uh, Tilapia or carpa is biblical fish. Jewish people can eat them, you know, because they are considered clean because they have fish scales and everything, you know. So that's what they grow. So, yeah, it's, it's nice and calm. And, and, and I tried to save some of the water, actually, from Jordan River, the Sea of Galilee. Then I found out I cannot bring it with me, you know, because I might be in trouble. So that's uh, just picture yourself 2,000 years ago when Christ was with his disciples during this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. So we'll uh, talk about three things about this passage of scripture. We see here the problem and the prayer and the power of God. So first is we have the problem in this passage of scripture. Actually, two problems. We have a sinking ship and a sleeping Savior. All right, let's remember that the disciples were led into this storm by following their master, as we read in verse 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And if you will turn in Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, there's also a parallel passage of scripture there, verse 35. And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Christ said his disciples, let us pass over onto the other side. All right. Christ could have urged them to uh, go by land because you can travel. If, if you were in, in, um, in that area, there's a way you can travel on the other side by land. But Christ wants, to, wants the disciples to go through the storm because, of course, he knows there will be a storm brewing. And he wants to show uh, his power to them. He's trying to teach them uh, a lesson. And when it says in verse 36, and when they had sent away the multitude, and, and here is the time when Christ was busy all day healing, teaching, and multitudes are thronging before him with different needs. And I believe before he sent them away during this time, he, he tried to help them, maybe heal them, maybe uh, give them uh, wonderful counsels from the word of God. And they sent the multitude away. They took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And look at this. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. This is more details, but the same story in Matthew chapter 8. And they awake him, saying, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And... 
be noticed. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And the Bible says, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So two problems in this story. A sinking ship because of the storm, because of the waves that are pouring its water inside the, that boat, that fishing boat, that ship that they are in. And look and behold, Christ is still sleeping. Total peace. So Christ asked them to follow him right into the storm. So we might say some believe that storms come for the Christian only when they rebel or disobey God. But that is not always true, isn't it? Because God's will is not always smooth sailing. We believe in the um, direct will of God in our lives, isn't it? Or the active, active will or perfect will of God in our lives. Of course, his, his will is that everybody will be saved. That he's not willing that any should perish, isn't it? His will for a believer is to read your Bible, you know, pray every day, walk with him in faith. You know, uh, obey his commandments, uh, support your local church. That's his imperative will, direct will, perfect will. But sometimes also God has his permissive will, passive will in our lives. When we try to do our own way and God allows that to happen in our, in our lives because he wants us to teach something. Because he wants us to rely that his will, his active direct will is always the best for our lives. So this kind of storm that had happened in Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to 27 uh, is not out of the ordinary on the Sea of Galilee. As I said, it is surrounded by mountains and hills. And sometimes the cool air comes over the mountains and mixed with the warm sea air. And violent storms can erupt without much warning. And that's just how storms in our lives come, isn't it? Without warning. Sometimes one minute the sun is shining and the next there's lighting and flashing and thunder booming and the winds and the waves go wild. We might say in our lives the phone rings and in seconds your life is changed. Now you are in the midst of a storm. You have a routine doctor visit that was to be quick and simple but the look on your doctor's face tells the story. Even the words are out of his mouth that you're in a terrible storm. It can happen as you go through an intersection in a flash that happened to us, you know? In a flash, you go to the same route, but you met an accident, and what's the first thing that you will, will pray for? Lord, spare me. Lord, save me. Lord, help me, you know? But to some of us, to some people that we know, it just tremendously changed their entire life. In a flash, or when your boss calls you into the office, you're in the middle of a storm. Maybe you lost your job, you were laid off, or something. Or when you open that hospital bill, uh, will a tweet change your life drastically? Hmm. Or a post? So, storm can arise suddenly, violently, and without warning. But we can say, as Christians, as we study God's word, that storms come due to a variety of causes. And I'll just list three. Sometimes we blow up our own storms. Amen? It's our own making, so to speak. Like, for example, a, a biblical illustration is Jonah. Jonah, the minor prophet. You know, doesn't mean he's just 17 or below, but um, he just wrote a shorter book than the other major prophets. Amen? Like Isaiah, but Jonah, we know him. We know him because his association with the great big fish that swallowed him. So what had happened to him? He decided not to do God's will when God's will was perfect and clear to him. Isn't it? To go to Nineveh and preach to the people there that there's judgment coming. Because as we study, Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And these people are so wicked in the eyes of God, but God is just merciful and he is trying to give them a chance to repent. So he sent this prophet as his mouth, mouthpiece to forewarn them, to uh, preach to them about the coming judgment. And Jonah refused to do so because he hates them. Because these people killed 
A lot of his people, these people from Nineveh and Assyria, had uh, plagued them with, with their tyranny. So he really wants judge, the judgment of God to be upon them. So in his flesh, I don't want to obey God. So we know the story. You know, we know how many times in Jonah, even chapter 1, that he went down. He went down from going to Nineveh. He went down to Joppa to uh, appear there to go to Tarshish, to Spain, the opposite of where he's supposed to go. He went down to Tarshish. He went down into the heart of the ship. And he went down because of that into the heart of the sea. And he went down into the belly of the whale. And once you decided not to follow God's best, there's only one way to go, and that's down. Isn't it? All right, we have some slides here of Jonah. There you go. Hmm. I'm bad with drawing. <laughs> but we can identify that's Jonah because of the big <laughs> fish tail. All right. All right, next. All right, so when he went down to the belly of that fish, Let's say that's inside the belly of the fish. So if there is the first man that went into the moon, as historic, here is the first man that went to a foam blubber mattress. Reminds me of my pillow commercial of Mike Lindell, you know? <laughs> this is the best pillow you ever have. And look, Jonah was in the bellies, uh, fish, fish belly for three days and three nights. And before, a lot of agnostic, atheists, skeptics of the Bible don't believe that the Bible is true because they said nobody can survive three days and three nights in a fish belly. But don't you know, through history, they have uh, uncovered people who were swallowed by big, uh, big, big whales and blue sperm whale, and they survived. And Jonah survived. And uh, we know from the book of Jonah that he had a wonderful prayer meeting inside there and he had a free trip to go to where he's supposed to go isn't it and uh you know in the new testament when the pharisees and the sadducees and the scribes are asking jesus to give them a sign that he who he, he is that he claims to be and he said you perverse generation your heart stricken with unbelief there's no sign given to you to the religious and believing people but the sign of jonah he said isn't it as jonah was in the fish belly for three days and three nights, so is the son of man be. So if he quoted Jonah, Jesus Christ, so it means Jonah's life his story is really true. Wow. It truly had happened. Amen. And of course, it's in the scripture, so it's true. Amen. It happened. So that just, you know, uh, take away that debate from the unsaved world that this account is never true. But look at what happened. He went down, down, and down. Because he did not obey the Lord. So he made up his own storm. And remember, like the people who don't even believe in God or believe in different gods, when that storm was brewing, they're, uh, they're about to die. And, and Jonah was sleeping, you know, inside the boat, probably on the, the lowest part of the ship. You know, they all start calling before God. And, of course, Jonah was awakened and he said, I'm the cause of this storm. Throw me overboard. And we know what had happened. The storm ceased. There was calm. So yung, siya yung malaking plague. Siya yung malaking balat. No? He's the cause because he was out of God's will. So we can blow up our own storm because when sometimes we disobey or rebel against God. You now there's a storm that happened not just individually like Jonah but through, through families. You know, the sons of Korah that rebel against God and his uh, leader Moses were swallowed up by the earth, isn't it? But the sons of, of jo Joshua and his family, when he said in Joshua 24, 15, you know, as for me and my house, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers had served on the other side of the flood, but as for me and my house, he said, we will serve the Lord. It's opposite, isn't it? A family, a whole clan that rebelled, sons of Korah, were judged by God, but Joshua, he adhere to the people, encourage them, As for me and my house. I don't know about you, but for me and my house, by God's grace, we will serve the Lord. But also it could happen, we brew up our own storm nationally. Isn't it? Proverbs 29 verse 2. I think we have a passage of scripture there. When uh, the righteous 
are in authority, I believe that's what it says, the people rejoice. When the wicked bear it rule, the people mourn. And here in America, of course, it happened in the nation of Israel when they disobeyed God, when they go to idolatry and immorality, the judgment of God will come upon them because God loves them and he wants to correct them. God wants to bring them back to the fold. But let's talk about our nation right now. We are commanded by God to pray for those that are in authority above us. And uh, you're aware, I don't have to go to details about the policy that are being uh, implemented right now. And, you know, uh, our standing as a church, we believe that we need to support those whose policy are pro-Bible, pro-biblical. You know, we believe in uh, the sanctity of life. We believe in uh, marriage between man and woman. Things that the Bible says are right in God's eyes. It's, these are the precepts, the principles of the Bible. But what will you do when the authority above you are doing the opposite way? Uh, do you have to like go in protest, you know, and uh, do stuff that are sort of crazy? Of course, our voice has to be heard and, and be known. We need to stand for what is right, isn't it? But one of the best things that we can do as a Christian is just pray. Is just keep our Christian testimony and witness to what God has done to us personally and individually. How God changed us. Because sometimes what's happening in America right now probably is just a judgment of God. When the nation turned its back from the Judeo-Christian belief that this nation was founded on. Because foundation will affect your future. Isn't it? Foundational truths are very important nowadays because I tell you, it's really sad. A lot of our young people, a lot of our, our young ones right now are being deceived, being, uh, having this delusion because of the things that they see in mainstream media and it's what other people are saying. So it might be true. It must be true. But it doesn't end up that way because you have to search. You have to study. You have to look at what God's word says. If it's in tune to God's word, then you need to support it. You need to believe it. That's why we need to know what you believe in. Amen? So, yes. So if not, it, it doesn't matter about whose party it is being implemented, isn't it? What matters is what does saith the Lord? What does the Bible say? So that should direct what we should believe and support. But in general, God admonishes us, we ought to pray for our government. We ought to pray for our leaders, that the fear of the Lord will be upon them. And let's pray that we will continue to enjoy our freedom of religion, spiritual freedom in Christ, and we will take advantage to reach out those people that we need to reach, that we need to witness to, because we don't know when would this continue on, because we believe in, we live in a day and age of, uh, of silencing, uh, the other party. We believe in the age of like, tolerance or if you don't offend me, you know, and, and we know truth offends other people because it's the truth. Truth hurts, but truth also heals. And truth also is the only way to get to heaven. Jesus said he's the embodiment of the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So it doesn't matter what this party says or that party says, this people says, but the absolute truth is always derived from the Bible. So if it's not from the Bible, then you know, it can never be the truth. And it could never be set free. You'll be in bondage and slave. So let us know what we believe in. Amen? Amen. And the church can help you uh, do that. Uh, spiritual teachers and mature believers can help you. And good counsel can help you to see what's the truth from God's word. And if you're really a, a Christian, you need to search for the truth yourself. And there's the Holy Spirit of God that will guide you, that will guide you. You need just to be open-minded. You need, just need to be sensitive. So let's pray for this country because sin is a reproach to any people. You know, righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If it is not of God's mercy, isn't it? This country has met its doom. The judgment. Imagine all the innocents of being killed in a daily basis. All 
the immoralities being committed, all uh, things that are not pleasing in the eyes of God are being committed. But if God is not merciful and gracious, then we will not be here. G judgment had been poured out. But look at this. What had happened in 9-11? It's going to be 20 years of commemorating that tragic event, isn't it? Uh, this 2021. Wow. How that long. See, a lot of Christians are saying it's a wake-up call because America has turned its back. And, and things happen that way in, in our history because God wants to direct our attention to him. God wants to a nation to see its spiritual state. The Christians, the church, its spiritual state. So this storm can be brought to us individually, as a family, or nationally, because it's our own making. But secondly, some storms, God creates himself. Such as in John chapter 6. If we look there in John chapter 6, uh, the scripture, we know that this is Jesus Christ feeding the 5,000. And imagine that. Miraculous feeding. And these people are very happy. Wow, if we made Jesus king, we will never get hungry. He will perform miracles. So they want to make him as a king by force. And of course, the disciples are happy because later on, they are asking themselves who is the greatest among them. And some of them are asking who is going to sit on Jesus Christ's throne on his right hand and his left hand, isn't it? Because they are seeing the people that they would like to make Jesus as king. But is that what really the mission of Christ why he first came here on earth? To establish a literal kingdom. You know, they missed his teaching that he's there to save all of mankind and build a spiritual kingdom. But there are also a time and a place for that promised kingdom, literal kingdom, for the Israelite people, for the Jews. And that, that we know right now is the millennial reign of Christ, where he will fulfill his promise because he knew that he will reject, they will reject him as their Messiah. So when they tried to make him as king, the disciples were tempted to give in to the pressure of popularity. But Jesus said, no. Get into the boat and we'll go to Capernaum. And along the way, they again, again ran directly into the middle of another storm. Why? I believe he did it to divert their attention from something that would have created a bigger problem in their lives. As I said, they want to be proud, have pride in their hearts right now. Oh, I'm popular because I'm following Jesus. Oh, I'm one of his disciples, so, you know, I'm important too. And, oh, he's probably going to establish his kingdom. Then I'll be one of the officers or uh, ha have a big part in it. So we can learn from this that sometimes God sends us little storm to keep us from heading into a bigger one. Isn't it? That's good. It happens in our lives. If we search what's happening in our lives as a Christian, God sometimes sends us little storm of correction to keep us from heading into a bigger one. Because he loves us. There's a story of a little boy. He was play, playing with his sailboat at the edge of a lake. And it got away from him and he couldn't reach it. So he didn't want to lose it. And he had this ingeniously bright idea. He thought of a plan. He started picking up rocks and tossing them on the other side. Brilliant, isn't it? Pass the boat. So the waves of that rock brought back the boat to him in his outstretched arms and the lesson in that story is when we drift away from the Lord he sometimes does the same the storm drives us right back into the arms of Jesus because he doesn't want us to go into a bigger one of our own making so God sometimes creates that storm for our benefit but also some storms are satanic in origin hmm the devil himself is sometimes the source. So when, when Brother Bobby preached last Wednesday about Job, it seems like there is consensus between God and the devil. <laughs> Isn't it? Because God said, have you known my servant Job? What a recommendation, uh, an adjustment and a pride. You know, because before then, the devil had access as the accuser of the brethren to be 
in, in heaven. And the devil said, no, he just believed you, he trusts you because you blessed him. Take away his blessing, he will curse you to your face. So they had a mutual consent and agreement that <laughs> this storm will uh, happen in the life of Job, isn't it? So sometimes it comes from the devil. But most Bible scholars, if you take note, believe the storm in Matthew chapter 8 was devil-driven. Because in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 8, we see the words rebuke. Jesus is often said to have rebuke demons. In Luke 8, the same storm is written about this passage of scripture. And Jesus said to it in, in, in Luke 8 or Mark 4.39, be still. We read it a while ago. In the Greek language, it's the word for muzzling a dog. Be still, muzzling a dog. So it's possible that this storm was another attempt of Satan to destroy Jesus while he was sleeping, no less. Because all along his plan is to kill the Messiah. To kill Jesus either in his uh, lineage, corrupt the lineage, uh, corrupt the line, or destroy the babies during the time of Moses, destroy and kill the babies during the time when he was born after the wise men. All along he wants to stop the Messiah from coming. But right now he's here, but he wants to end his life before going to the cross. But we believe that Satan had no power to take the life of Jesus. Amen? Because the Bible says only himself would be given, be able to give his life. Because he would like to give his life and offer it voluntarily, willingly. He says that he gave up the ghost. Isn't it? In the last seven sayings of Christ, the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers did not take his life. He gave it to us willingly. Amen. That's why his death is a vicarious death. He died for our place. He is our substitute. Vicariously, and it was voluntarily, and of course it is also victoriously. Because he defeated the sting of death, the curse of sin, when he died on the cross, when he paid our sin debt, when he appeased the wrath of God, when judgment was poured upon him. He gave up the ghost. This passion of Christ led to his victorious death. So, probably, Satan wants to kill him during that time, but Christ said, that's, that's not his time. He has no power over my life because I have to give it willingly. So sometimes Satan kicks up a storm in our life to try to get us off on track, isn't it? On one occasion, another illustration, the Apostle Paul said, I think in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that I would have come to you, but Satan hindered me. Satan hindered me. Well, you try that on your boss. Next time you're late for work. Oh, I'm late because Satan hindered me. Will that work? <laughs> Probably not. Just use other excuses, Christians. Not that, not that with Apostle Paul. Another reason I believe the devil was behind this storm is because it was extraordinary in nature. So understand the disciples were raised at this lake, at this Sea of Galilee. And they had fished, it, had fished on it for years. So no doubt they've been through some countless storm in that part of their area. But in this case, they all thought that they were going to die. It was so severe. They were frantic. So it could be devised by the devil himself. So we have a problem. That's a sinking ship. And we know from the story that the flood waters came in. And it seems like a hopeless situation. And to make matters worse, the Savior is sleeping. And this is the only time in the scripture that he uh, was asleep. And it shows us that Jesus Christ is truly human. Amen? Jesus Christ, in, in his sinless infirmities, experienced what? ordinary, normal human beings experience. That's why it uh, takes that debate that, oh, Jesus Christ did not come literally in this world 2,000 years ago. He was just a spirit. You know, uh, he was just a myth, but there's no literal Jesus. No, he was here. Not just it was recorded in the scripture, but we see his activities as a person, as a human being. He hungered, he thirsted, you know, he slept during this time because he was truly a human. 
And in the storm, he was asleep. Several other times we find the disciples sleeping when Jesus has an important business. As they said, probably these disciples were Baptists because they love to sleep. All right? The Garden of Gethsemane, when Christ said, wash and pray for several times, when he came back, check them, they're sleeping. Isn't it? Are they also sleeping in the month of transfiguration? Huh? So we find that disciples are sleeping every now and then. But here, only time that the scripture records in the gospel, he was asleep. Why? He was asleep because he was tired. All day he was healing, he was teaching. But you know what? His sleep is designed, it's not just desirous to be refreshed, but it was designed that he will be awakened to show something great to his disciples. Ever been in a storm of life and it seemed like that God was sleeping? Where are you, Lord? You might ask. Don't you know what's going on in my life right now? Don't you care? And we have that Tagalog song by Gary Balenciano. Natutulog ba ang Diyos? Totoo, natutulog siya during this time. In this instant when Christ was asleep. So sometimes when I go through a storm, I feel like I have it all figured out sometimes. I know what the Lord ought to do. I know I might suggest how he ought to do it and when and now. But two hard lessons that we should consider. God doesn't need my advice. Amen? Because he's all-knowing. He's omniscient. God doesn't, God doesn't need to work on my own timetable. He'll do it in his way in his time. He doesn't need a wake-up call. Because he never oversleeps. Amen? He's always on the throne and in full control. He's always on the throne and in full control. Remember the story of Lazarus? They sent word to Jesus that his friend Lazarus was sick. And Lazarus was dear to Jesus' heart. He always visits them. He always fellowship with them. Together with his siblings, Mary and Martha. The Bible says specifically that Jesus stayed where he was two days more. And then, when he finally learned that Lazarus died, he went. And we know the shortest verse in the Bible, in John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Christ, once again, showed his humanity. He really loved his dear friend Lazarus. He wept for him. He showed some mourning. And you heard, you, heard, you remember, you recall, what you heard from Martha, you know, it's like you're, you're, he's, she's saying, like paraphrasing, if you had been here, our brother would have not died, like a translation. Well, look who's finally decided to show up. <laughs> Hope it is not too much of an inconvenience to you, Jesus. It might interest you to know that he's dead now. He's been there in the grave four days. You're four days late, Jesus. But you know what? We know the rest of the story that God is never late. He always have a purpose and a plan for all things. Don't you know that he came there four days later because he wants to dispel the belief of the Jewish people during that time? That when a person dies, that's why they don't, uh, English in Balsamo. They don't embalm the dead. They just like, you know, bury them right away or they put spices and stuff like that to preserve their body because they believe that their spirit still hovers around for four days and they might have a chance to be revived. So Christ came there to dispel that belief that Lazarus is really dead, dead. He is like when we go to uh, an autopsy or when somebody, a medic uh, medical examiner, they will do the official report that this person died at this time. Such place, such time. That's official report, isn't it? That's legally binding. So Christ came there four days late because he's showing something. That he has the power over death. There's a slide here. That's why when, you know, he showed uh, his power when he declared Lazarus, come forth. I always make a joke. Thank God, you know, he said Lazarus, come forth. He did not just say, come forth. Amen? Because... It will be an early resurrection time for those people who are in that grave. And that should have shocked all those Jewish people and everybody fled 
the police be all oh, the dead are raised. Oh, what happened? You know? But he specifically restored the life of Lazarus. And we know he died again. But he's a sick person, you know? But what a miracle. See? Christ is always working on his own timetable time because he is always in full control. And we believe in that story a lot of Jewish religious people believe. Very part of it is Joseph of Arimathea. You know, Nicodemus, isn't it? Pharisees and rulers, they believe. Wow! Truly this is the Messiah we're waiting for. That's a great story, isn't it? Lazarus come forth. So it may seem sometimes when we're in the midst of the storm that he's asleep or God is late, but we need to remember his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and God is sometimes early, but he's never too late. He's never too late. There's a story of a man that asked the Lord, is it true that for you 10,000 years is just like a minute? It's like what the Bible says in First Peter, isn't it? A thousand years is a day to the Lord, you know, which says that God is beyond time, is transcendent beyond time. He is timeless. He is not being controlled by time because he is the author of time. He's the maker of time. All of us as human beings operate in time because we have time, space, and matter, and that composes our activities. But God, he is above time. He is in time all the time, anytime, isn't it? He's already been in the past, present, and the future. He knows all things and in between. So he's timeless. So he said, is it true that for you, Lord, 10,000 years is just like a minute? God said, yes. And is it true that a million dollars to you on earth is just like a penny in heaven? Yes. Lord, could I have a penny? God said, just a minute. <laughs> Wait, 10,000 years. All right. So there's the problem on that story, and there's the prayer. Let's uh, hurry on. Verse 25. It says there in chapter 8, verse 25, And his disciples came to him and awoke him. Hmm. Woke coach. Huh? <laughs> Sad. Saying, Lord, save us, we perish. So, we have a quote here. What you do during a storm reveals who you are and who you are. What you are and who you are. So, what's your first impulse in a storm, sudden storm? Do you run to a friend? You have a friend in me, you know. A toy Story. Mm -hmm. That's good if your friend will give you godly counsel. And they are walking with the Lord. Isn't it? In a multitude of counsel, there is safety, the Bible says. But it's not supposed to be the first response you should have. When a storm in life hits you suddenly, do you run to the nearest exit? Try to make your own way through a diversion? Maybe for an unsaved person, a drug? Or something that will dull the pain? Will help them forget? The storm will still be there when you come back down, isn't it? And maybe more will await you due to your bad behavior when you go to those substances. Drugs and alcohol, this and that. Try to cope up with that storm. But look at what happened here. As we all know, the disciples went to Jesus first. And so should we. Practical lang yun, no? Wala silang choice, eh. <laughs> They're just in the boat in the midst of the storm. And Christ is just there. Huh? So character is revealed in the storm. The storms of life will either draw you closer to the Lord or further away. It is our choice. But take note, no one will emerge. I hope this will be true to us. No one will emerge on the other side of the storm the same as they entered in. Either you will become bitter to the Lord or better for him. Because you're going to go to a refiner's fire. Isn't it? When you go through a storm. So what did they did? They went to Jesus. What did they said? Lord, save us. We perish. Lord, save us. We perish. It's one of the most shortest recorded prayer in the Bible. Isn't it? So when we're in trouble, we cut down on the long fancy prayers and rumblings and get right down to business. It happened when Peter walked on the water and took his eyes of Jesus, another storm. And look at the storm and began to go under. It began to sink. But then he prayed this famous three-word prayer like this one. Lord, save me. But for the disciples, Lord, save us. 
For Peter, Lord, save me. Peter, during this time, didn't have time to have these long fancy prayers. Oh, God of Jeroboam. Oh, God of Rehoboam. And all the Boam boys. Oh, the God of Jehoshaphat. And all the fat boys. No? He didn't go. But he said, Lord, save me. The disciples, Lord, save us. Oh, there are some, several times I prayed that prayer. Probably you too, isn't it? You're suddenly struck in the midst of a storm. Lord, that's all you can say. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, have mercy upon me. And isn't it great God heard your prayer? God delivered you. Same thing that happened with these disciples. But look, there's a contradiction in that prayer. Lord, save us, in Matthew chapter 8, is the language of faith. We perish is the language of fear. Do you notice that? Now, isn't that just us like humans trying to have faith and fear at the same time? But you know what? They are mutually exclusive. They are spiritually opposite. Faith and fear cannot cohabit the same heart at the same time. When you're looking at the storm, you are filled with fear. But when you're looking to Jesus, you are going to be filled with faith. As the Bible says in Hebrews 12, to looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher with our faith. Quickly, here's three reasons why the disciples should have mingled fear with their faith, and we can learn something from this. First is they had a promise from Jesus that they were going to make it to the other side. He said, isn't it, before they left, let us pass on to the other side. So Jesus knew that they will survive. This storm, they will be able to pass through. Because he promised them, let us pass to the other side. That's in the parallel passage in Mark chapter 4. You see, all of God's commandments are God's enablements. So when God commands you to do something, he will give you the strength and the power to do it for his glory. Because God's commandments are God's enablements. He won't ask us to do something we cannot do without his help. You see, he did not promise a storm-free, easy trip, but he did indeed guarantee success. And that's what faith really is, isn't it? Just trusting on the promises of God. Because one of the songs that we heard in this church is God always already sees the storm on the other side. God sees the storm on the other side. Maybe some of you are going through some rough, times in your life right now you're in the middle of the storm i want to encourage you this afternoon god had already guaranteed a success in your life if you'll keep trusting him because our final destiny is already secured worst comes to worst we'll make it to heaven amen by the grace of god huh sakit man pagkakautang man lost man if we put our eyes on Jesus, fix our eyes upon him by faith and still believe on what he had promised, we will make it. It's a guaranteed success. Because that's what he said in his word for a a child of God, for a believer. We just need to exercise that faith. Secondly, the Lord himself was in the boat with them. Amen. That means God will never leave us nor forsake us during the hardest time, difficult times of our lives. You know, That very day, these disciples had seen him cleanse the leper and heal the countless others and cast out demons. It's just right to say they should have complete, they should have had complete confidence that he can handle their situation, isn't it? So that's why this is a good reason for our ministries here of prayer chain and now prayer covenant. This is a good reason for us to keep a a prayer journal if we can. Not only list a request, Prayer request, but also list the request that was answered, that we prayed for, that reminds us of the testimony of God's power. Third reason, not only he was in the boat with them, he promised that they would make it to the other side, but they could see that the Lord himself was at perfect peace. He had a pillow in Mark chapter 4, and he was sleeping on the other part of the ship. You see, when you have a situation and you see someone you respect is calm as they view it. It has a calming effect on you. The opposite is true if they react in a fuss. 
So I hope you have a Christian friend or a Christian mentor that you look upon. All right? That when you see in their life they went through a storm, but they still hold on the anchor of their soul on God. And they have confidence, complete confidence and peace. I, I don't mean that they never worried, you know, but they still hold on to God's word and promises. And they went through that storm and got out of it victoriously. Those are people that we can look up to, isn't it? Because when you ask counsel to them and they talk to you, now you have a confidence that they really know what they're talking about because they already experienced firsthand the guiding and power full hand of God. So Christ here was at perfect peace. I'm not saying, I don't know, kung nagihilik pa ang Panginoon. Masarap ang tulog niya. Could be. O hindi lang narinig ng mga disciples kasi all they hear is the thunder, the, hear the lightning, the boisterous wind, and the waves, and it's going to their ship. But you look here. He was still at perfect peace. We need to learn how to weather the storms of life, isn't it? Not just pray for them to go away. It's like, uh, you know, when we're raising our kids for the older people here, you know, <clears throat> when your kids get scared of a thunderstorm and they run to your bed and they ask you if you're scared, how it happened to me. And you always say by pride, oh, no, I'm not scared of this storm. But you're really scared too, isn't it? Huh? But if you say you're not scared, that calms them. And they, hey, can I stay here for a while? Can, can be in the covers with you? You know? So as Christians, it should calm us to know that wherever we're going through, our God is not shocked. He's not wringing his hands in despair, wondering what's next. He's always in full control. Amen. Thirdly and last, and we'll end the power. In verse 26, it says, Dear, then he arose. In verse 24, the Bible says, A storm arose. Now it says in verse 26 that Jesus arose. He calmed that storm. And you know what? He doesn't always do this. Sometimes he lets the storm rage on. But he calms his child in the midst of the storm. That is one of the best part. And take note, in the other preceding verses in Matthew chapter 7 and Mark chapter 4, don't you know that he uses this pulpit to teach people, to preach and teach? He made it his pulpit. And he's going to save this pulpit. Amen? In the midst of the storm. So it's still going to be intact to go to the other side. Now, Because God used that object to do his will. So he's taking care of it. So even that. And much more are the disciples whom, whom he's going to use. Later on to send them and preach the gospel and will turn the world upside down. So sometimes he doesn't calm the storm. He calms his child. He always keeps us safe till the storm passes by. The problem that day was not the storm, the sinking ship, or the sleeping Savior, but it was, once again, in the unbelief, in the hearts of the disciples. Jesus asked them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? In verse 26. He did not chide them for their prayers of waking them up. As I said, this storm, when he sleep, as I said a while ago, Jesus said, it's, it's not designed just for him to be refreshed physically, but it was designed so he can be awakened and show his power, his majesty. It says there, then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And we know the answer for that. He's not just an ordinary man. He's God's only begotten son. Amen. He is God. In the flesh. He's the God who created the universe. He's the God who controls the law of nature. He's the God who spoke, spoke the world into existence. So he has control. As Colossians says, he did not just create the world, but he sustains it with his power. He keeps every atoms and molecules and, and planets and galaxies and in the right orbit, the earth, by his power. He holds everything in his power. So these things will not collide and cause chaos because when he created, he created things in order. So when God says, okay, no more orbit, no? what will happen to the world? Hmm? No more gravity. I will not hold the world into my power. I will not sustain it. Then we, will, we are going to be in trouble. 
but because of his power, he holds everything in his hands. That's why we're still here. So the question, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is just teaching them something. Thank God, thank God. In Christ, our past is settled, our present is covered, and our future is secure. Let me end with this verse of scripture in Psalms 107, verse 23 to 30. Here are some verses written hundreds of years before this storm. And they said, if you really know to learn the power of prayer, go to the sea. Go uh, sailing around the world. You, know, you will learn how to pray. You will learn how to depend on God. Um, yeah. Be a seaman. Yeah. And you will really, uh, oh God, help me. But he look at this verse of scripture, Psalms 1. 07, 23 to 30. They that go down in the sea in ships that do business in great waters, this see the works of the Lord. See? See, man? And his wonders in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then, what happened? When they are in the middle of the storm in the sea, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm come, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. I tell you, Christians, if you're in the midst of the storm, you're about to approach a storm, you're about to go out of the storm, I tell you, in all of those things, God will bring you to your desired heaven if you will just trust in him. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you for this simple message. Thank you, Lord, that even though we've heard about this passage of scripture, about the power of Christ over nature, the power of Christ in calming the hearts of his people, his disciples who are fearful, we can learn something again. Thank you, Lord, for this song that uh, reminded us we are sheltered in the arms of God. So let the storms rage high, the dark clouds rise, they won't worry me, for I'm sheltered safe within the arms of God. He walks with me, and naught of earth shall harm me, for I'm sheltered in the arms of God. Lord, I'm praying now for some of our brethren. We have some, Lord, that are in the midst of a storm, in their physical well-being, in some of uh, the relationship, maybe financially, Lord, and sometimes we are discouraged, we are feeling hopeless, but once again, thank you, Lord, for this simple message that allowed us, Lord, to refocus upon Jesus, that He's not sleeping, He's actively watching over us, praying, waiting for us to come to Him in faith, in prayer, and ask for His help. Three, our God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So we can find comfort in your words this afternoon. And I'd ask you to have a moment of prayer, whatever God has pondered upon your heart. But if you're here this afternoon, uh, there's a storm brewing in the horizon at the end of this time. It's what we call the judgment of God for someone who is already condemned because of their sin there's what we call hell a literal place which is the eternal destiny of a person who's lost who's not saved but the gospel is the good news that Jesus loves you and he died for your sins and he wants to save you today if you just place your faith and trust upon him he, he'll save you you don't have to go through that furious storm of God's wrath that he will pour out upon this earth in that great tribulation area great tribulation time you can be spared from the wrath of God to come because Christ already took that wrath of God over sin on the cross all you need to do is to accept Christ's gift of eternal life if you're not saved if you don't know for sure where you can spend your eternity when you die encourage you to trust Christ today. Just call upon His name like this way. Lord Jesus, I believe 
that I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I admit that I'm lost. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I repent of all of it. And I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. Save me. And thank you for salvation you've given to me today. And help me to know you more and serve you and live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you had prayed that prayer if you're not sure yet where you're going to spend your eternity. But if you're a Christian here this afternoon, it's my prayer that you've been edified and encouraged. Whatever storm you're going through, and if you've come through that storm victoriously, if you already saw the silver lining behind that stormy clouds, may God be praised. Amen. And we can share that testimony to others who's also going through some rough, rough times in, in their life or his or her life. But that storm will never be there for all eternity. It will pass by. It will do. Just have faith in God. Because He already guaranteed a safe landing, a safe arrival. We have that blessed place called heaven waiting for those that will continue to faith, put their faith and trust upon the Lord. So I hope we put this in our minds and in our hearts today. We have that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So hold on. Hold on. Cling on to God. Keep that anchor rested on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for this great example of our Savior who's calm and a perfect peace who knows what we're going through. Thank you, Lord, for being our high priest who knows what we're feeling and our infirmities and we can call upon your name, commune with you directly and we can express and tell you everything that's in our hearts, our worries, our anxieties, we can verbally tell you in our prayers. And we know, Lord, that you will listen, you will hear, and forgive us, Lord, for times that we, our faith is diminished, or our, our faith is getting smaller when we have a, a big storm, a big wave, big wind of trials or testing happening upon us. Help us, Lord, to continue to focus on you and just believe on your promises. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for uh, the past storms that you enable us to go through, which make us like um, a better servant of thee, make us stronger in our faith. And sometimes you design this, Lord, so we will continue to depend upon you and cling upon you. So right now, Lord, whatever we're going to give us the wisdom and the strength to Lord, do your will. In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for listening. And uh, call Pastor Jeter to come, please. And close us in a song. And amen. Praise be to God for that beautiful message. And I hope that you are blessed this afternoon. So let's stand for our last song. Uh, to relate the song to our message this afternoon, we are going to sing Till the Storm Passes By, 876. So let's sing all the stanzas, okay? On the first, now. In the dark of the midnight Have I oft hid my face while the storms howl above me and there's no hiding place may the crash of the thunder precious lord hear my cry keep me safe till the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the cloud rolls forever from the sky hold me fast let
that may stand in the hollow of thine hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. On the second, many times Satan whispered, there is no need to try, for there's no end of sorrow, there's no hope by and by. But I know thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the storm never darken the skies. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, Till the cloud roll forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thine hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. On the last now. When the long night has ended and the storms come so more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee till the storm passes by till the storm passes over till the thunder sounds no more till the clouds rolls forever from the sky hold me fast let me stand in the hand keep me safe till the storm passes by amen beautiful singing brethren so let's have a word of prayer our gracious god heavenly father once again we are so thankful we are so blessed you're giving us uh given us um this wonderful day thank you lord for your people thank you lord for the messages that we heard from thy servants and the teachers of the Lord. And thank you, Lord, so much for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That when we are in the storm, you're always there for us. Always um, giving us the peace that passes all understanding. And thank you, Lord, for the assurance, O oh Lord, that you have given to each everyone who accepted you as their Lord and personal Savior of their life. And we know that we have a secured place in heaven. But while we are here, O oh Lord, on earth, we know, Lord, we have a lot of testing, trials, and storms of life. Lord, help us, O oh Lord, to depend on you, to trust in you, and to have um, our faith to you, O oh Lord God. That according to your word in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that we have to look on you, looking to the author and the finisher of our faith, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the things that have trans transpired, O oh Lord, for this day. And Lord, um, help us, O oh Lord, to face another week with um, gladness in our hearts and with um, faith that we know, O oh Lord, that you are uh, always with us, O oh Lord God. And thank you, Lord, for always... Um, giving your blessing, Lord, to us. Your grace and mercy is always there. And Lord, help us, O oh Lord, to apply all the things that we heard uh, from the day or from the starting of this day uh, until this the very moment, oh Lord God, through thy word. And bless your people. Bless uh, us, O oh Lord, as we separate our ways. Guide us and protect us, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. For our closing verse, Psalms 143, verse 8, 
Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. And the people of God will say, Maranatha until he comes again. So see you next service, next meeting, next time. God bless everyone.